Welcome to Conversations with Lulu. As we enter our third year, I wanted to thank you, uh, our friends, our listeners, everybody who has sent me feedback, everybody who has encouraged me, and uh, everyone who has recommended the show to friends and colleagues. I want to say thank you so much, and it really means uh, so much to me. As we enter our third year, I would like to keep the focus on bringing guests that are working on extremely exciting projects uh, or ventures. And I'm also going to take your uh, feedback into consideration of focusing on the personal or trying to focus on the personal as much as the professional. I will, uh, I will do my best uh, to do that. So our guest for this uh, episode is an Emirati engineer who has been thrust into the spotlight back in 2014 when the United Arab Emirates decided that it wanted to develop its own space program and announced the Hope Probe. Amran Sharaf was 30 at the time and he became the project director of the Emirates Mars mission at the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center. He leads a 450 person team and he was tasked to not only launch but also develop and operate the Hope Probe, which is the first unmanned spacecraft that was sent to study, uh, to study Mars' atmosphere that has been completely developed by an Arab nation. In this talk, we're going to cover the significance of uh, studying Mars and what we hope to learn, the UAE government's entrepreneurial approach to this project, uh, leading big remote teams and the impact that this project has had on Amran, on the UAE and on the rest of the region. Um, so Amran, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. It's, uh, it's so exciting what you're working on and we've been following your progress uh, for a couple of years now. Thank you. And, uh, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm very curious um, to, to learn how it all began and how it all started. Uh, so maybe, I don't know if you, if you take us back to that day, if you remember uh, what happened when you got that call or that email saying that, you know, you have been selected uh, to lead on this uh, initiative. Uh, so as we were approaching the launch of Dubai Sat 2, which was basically on the 21st of November 2013, uh, on the evening of the 20th of November. I received a phone call from my director general and he told me basically... You were in South Korea? No, no. I was in Dubai. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and there was a team in Dubai waiting for the operations, the, for the first contact and the early operations. And there was a team from the UAE that was also in the launch site uh, to launch the spacecraft. Uh, I received a phone call from, from my director general in which he told me basically, uh, I mean, the UAE government is interested in, in looking or in to sending a mission to Mars. Is that something feasible? And, and he's like, he's like could, you, could you get back to me on this matter soon? And let's say the next day we have the launch of the device at two. So I asked him, is it okay if I set up a small team and, and, and we work on it together and, and we come up with, with a recommendation ASAP on this matter? Uh, and he agreed to that. So basically that team included uh, myself, I was leading it. Uh, it included uh, Sarah Lamiri, who is currently the Minister for uh, Advanced Technology. Um, and it included uh, my colleague Sayyid al-Dafri and also Ibrahim al-Qasim, who is currently the Deputy Director General of the UH Space Agency. Um, so we all work together and basically we are running between the command and control room and uh, <laughs> between the meeting rooms preparing for this study, you know, because they, they needed it urgently. Um, and, and, and basically the story of this, how this happened is basically around that time, the UAE government, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, uh, asked for the ministers, all of them, to, 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 to get together in uh, an island called Sir Benias in Abu Dhabi uh, to have a brainstorming session. Because uh, from that time till 2021, it was about seven years, and basically it's to discuss what needs to be done before the 50th anniversary of our nation. What are the significant disruptive projects we need to have so that we can celebrate our 50th, 50th anniversary uh, with, with big achievements, but also uh, to accelerate the development of certain areas that we have gaps in uh, before uh, we reach that date. And one of the ideas that came up was the Emirates Mars mission. So that's why we received that phone call. And, and quite quickly, we, we, we sent back feedback from our side to, the, to, 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 his, to, to, to his Highness, in which basically, yes, we can, but we said, like, what are the things that we need to have and if we were able to do it, what are the 
uh, kind of uh, uh, constraints or the limits that, that we will be able to operate with them. Okay. And basically, like, uh, do you remember? No, so basically, we need to go into a knowledge transfer program. We need to take untraditional approach to developing a system because if you want to reach Mars before the 2nd of December, 2021, at that point, we had only seven years, but we didn't really actually have seven years, we had only six years because the opportunity to launch to Mars comes once every two years. Every two years. Yeah. When they, this is when they align, right? It yes. aligns with, with the Earth. Yes. So if, if we want to reach before the 2nd of December, 2021, the op only opportunity we have is 2020. Okay. Um, so these are the things that we brought up, you know, uh, to, to His Highness's attention. Then, less than a month after, after that request, we received it, he met with us, His Highness. He came to the center, he had to sit down with us, and he gave us his requirements. Because one part of it also, we wanted to know, like, what's the expectation from the government? Just to reach Mars before that date, that's it? Or are there any other requirements? And His Highness was very, very clear to us. I mean. He said, again, the first requirement for me is I want us to reach Mars before the 2nd of December 2021 for two reasons. The first reason, we want to send a very strong message to the Emirati youth that uh, science and technology is a priority for us. Uh, and at the same time, he wanted to inspire the, 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 among the Emirati youth and among even the different sectors in the UAE the, and, and, and plant the seeds to have like more of an R&D focused culture. Uh, as you know, we come from a region, especially if we talk about no the UAE. No, we, we talk we're about we are merchants, you know, we are traders. Mm -hmm. Historically, we're known to, 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 to sell, buy things. And, and, and it's something that's it's, it's part of our, uh, how to say, uh, history. Yes. Uh, but again, if you want to compete and be competitive, you need to cope with what's happening around you in the world, you know, and if you want to talk about a competitive, and that's what I said, you know, if you want to have a competitive and a creative knowledge-based economy, then we need to have a quite advanced science technology sector in the UAE that is embedded in all critical sectors that we have and to drive our economy. Uh, and basically that's why, that's the message he wanted to send to the Emirati youth and to, to even, as I said, like certain uh, stakeholders in different sectors in the UAE. Um, and the, and, 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 and the, the other message basically is, is to, the, to the Arab youth is that, and at that time, if you remember, it was kind of the, the peak of the, the Arab Spring. So if a country like the UAE is able to reach Mars in less than 50 years, then given the history of this region, uh, given how much this region used to generate knowledge, then you, Arab youth, can do much more than building the region and building your nations. The other thing his highness told us, he said, build it, don't buy it. Mm -hmm. You can work with others. You can go through a knowledge transfer program the same way you did in the past, but build it, don't buy it. Do not start from scratch, okay? Which for us was extremely important because that saved us a lot of time. Uh, nations usually deliver missions like this in 10 to 12 years. We had only six years to deliver it. The third requirement he gave us was the science has to be novel. Don't do something that others have done, that others have done before. It needs to be something new. This, it's our contribution, the UAE's contribution to humanity. So basically this was UAE's first science diplomacy effort. Uh, the other requirement he gave us, he said, you don't have an open budget. <laughs> you have a very limited budget and you need to stick with that budget. You need to come up with a new model, a new approach of doing things that other nations can learn from us. I don't want us to just go and follow other nations in the way they do things. Let's come up with a new, more cost-effective, efficient uh, way of doing things. And that model we would like to share with the rest of the world. Uh, and then he said, you will be responsible to create a disruptive change in the UAE. Your job is not just to deliver spacecraft around Mars. It's not just technical. You will work with other sectors, you're gonna make people uncomfortable, and you're gonna make changes in multiple sectors that are critical for the sustainable development of the UAE and for the, competitive, for the competitiveness of the UAE. And you'll lead that. So this is my expectation from you. Uh, and part of the discussion that we had was also because basically uh, scientists or like engineers over the past 50 years, the UAE invested a lot in preparing them. They had mm -hmm. a career path, but scientists didn't have a career path. 
I mean, if people went into sciences, they either worked in very few labs Academia, in the government, maybe, or, or even just taught in schools, that's it. Yeah. He said, I want scientists to have similar career path as engineers. Why? Because if you're talking about the science and technology sector, you need to have the scientists who come up with the new mm. discoveries, and the engineers who take these discoveries and convert them into products. You know, it's part of it, uh, they complement each other. Yes. Uh, and he's like, this mission needs to, 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 to read that. So, so that's why the impact of the mission was beyond just reaching Mars. And that's why His Highness, a few days before reaching Mars, he made it very clear to us, he's like, you've accomplished most of the mission for us. More than 90% of the mission is accomplished. Reaching Mars is just yeah. one step. Because I, I read also that there was a, there, there was a 50, 50, 50 chance, right, of yeah. being able to uh, enter Mars orbit. Yes, there's 50% chance of failure because 50% of the missions that have been to Mars failed. And then we are using a platform that for the first time we develop, mm -hmm. the Emirates Mars mission team develops. Uh, so the Emirates Mars mission team consists of uh, about, oh, the people who worked on, on the Emirates Mars mission was about 450 people, uh, 200 Emiratis, 150 from our knowledge transfer partners. Uh, basically, our knowledge transfer partners were University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, Arizona State University, and the University of California, Berkeley, and about 100 subcontractors from around the world, okay. different parts of the world. All worked under the Emirates Mars Mission team as one identity. We had one identity. We didn't work, we didn't work as you know, separate entities. Everyone worked as the Emirates Mars Mission team. We had an Emirati reporting to someone from the U.S., someone from the U.S. reporting to someone from the UAE, so uh, that was for us very important to have that knowledge transfer. Okay. So it's not just about the explicit knowledge, it's also about the tacit knowledge that we need to gain. So and I'm going to ask you about, about yeah. the, the, the management side of things, but I think before, before we jump into that, I mean, I think the question, uh, you know, I heard you in a, in a previous talk, talk about why Mars, um, and there's a lot of talk about Mars, um, obviously there's a lot of business people trying to, to get there on a, on a global level. Um, so talk to us a little bit. I mean, I, you know, I was doing my research and, and reading up, up about Mars and I saw that, you know, scientists believe that like maybe 3.5 billion years ago, there used to be life on Mars. So can you talk to me about that side of the mission? Like why, you know, what's the significance of Mars? So, so why countries explore Mars? It's a very good question, by the way. And, and why the scientists are, inter are interested in it is because uh, scientists believe that uh, more than 4 billion years ago, Mars might have been similar to Earth. Okay. And, and, and something went wrong there and it turned into a dead planet. It lost its atmosphere, uh, it's lost, it's, it lost its, its, its feature, and it turned into a dead planet. So a us, dead planet meaning there's no oxygen? It's quite toxic. The majority of the atmosphere in, in, in Mars is CO2. It's CO2. Yeah, and it's a very cold planet, and the atmosphere is, is deteriorating. It's, I think I saw minus 60, I think minus 60 degrees. So it ranges between minus 160 to maximum, maximum plus 25, but the average is minus 60. Okay. So that's quite cold. Okay. Um, and there is water, but it's trapped in ice. So it's yeah. So it's part of the work that the scientists are trying to understand, like okay. uh, like if there is like liquid water and what are the compositions of the liquid water and what's the uh, how how did it like uh, originate or gen got generated there and things like this. Okay. So um, so us understanding what happened to Mars will help help us better understand what's happening around us in our universe, mm -hmm. but also help us understand the changes happening to our planet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's critical for if we talk about like you know uh, preserving our planet, protecting our planet, and and uh, uh, making sure that the future generations will have a safe environment to live in. It's important to study and see what happened there to to better understand what's happening around us and on Earth also. Um, because at the end of the day, whatever we do is all about Earth. It's about saving Earth. What What do you like? Is there um, when you when you go on on such a mission? Do you have like a hypothesis and you go there to collect data to prove it, or you just you go out there and you say like, is there something you'd hope to find out? So so basically, what happens is there is a science community that uh, specialized in, in international science community that specialized in Mars science. So they come up with scientific questions that are critical okay. in helping us understanding what, what's happening there. And we have members from our team who are part of that group. Okay. And that's how we came up with the science questions, which All is right. basically okay. understanding the 
or providing a holistic view of the Martian atmosphere at different times of the day, at different seasons, and understanding the, the, the relationship between the lower layer and the upper layer of the, of the, of the Martian atmosphere and the escape rate of hydrogen and oxygen. This, these questions were generated by our science team based on the, the, what's called the MEPAC group. And this MEPAC group basically they meet at least once a year. They look at the results of all, all, all Mars missions and, and what questions they've answered. And based on these questions, they generate new questions. So the questions that we've, we, are, we are answering are based on previous missions. And all future missions that are going to be studying Martian atmosphere and even maybe beyond Martian atmosphere uh, will base their questions okay. on, on, the, on the results also of the MS Mars mission. Okay. So, so that's how it works. There's no other nation wants to go to a different planet that far away and repeat what other nation did. Yeah. So it's a great collaboration effort, it is. otherwise it, it won't is. work. And, and let's be honest, for us also collaboration was critical uh, in achieving the, the deadline and also the budget. <laughs> uh, we, did, and we had to deliver the spacecraft for $200 million, which is quite cheap compared to other nations. Okay. So the reason why we did that... Do you that, have a comparison? Like, is there usually a, a I mean, if you look at other countries, some spend billions of dollars okay. or almost billions of dollars to, to, to put something around Mars or on Mars. Uh, we, we achieved it for 200 billion and it's, it's a number that we can defend. It's a number that we have, you know, uh, data to support also. So you were, you, you, you were very uh, entrepreneurial in, in, your, in your approach in a way because you... We, we had to be creative and innovative. Yeah. You know, so so for us. So I mean, you were very lean, basically. You had to collaborate yes. with others. You had a specific budget. You had a very stri- you had a very strict deadline that yep. you had to reach, uh, and you had to operate within certain constraints. And we had to lead the disruptive change that his highness wanted to see, in multiple sectors, uh, in the academic sector, in the in the industrial okay. sector, and and because of the Emirates Mars mission, a federal entity was established that's focused on space, which is the U.S. Space Agency. Uh, because of the Emirates Mars mission, uh, a council for scientists in the UAE for the first time was established. A council that, I mean, feeds back to the government and gives recommendations and policies on different matters. Uh, we didn't have a science council before, but because of the Emirates Mars mission, that was established. Because of the Emirates Mars mission, curriculums and universities changed. Universities that didn't have science programs started science programs because of the Emirates Mars mission. Students who were studying international relations, finance, switched majors into sciences because of the Emirates Mars mission. Um, the space sector in the UAE totally shifted from being just application focused, which was used to be just you know telecommunication satellites or uh, Earth observation satellites, to more of a like catalyst and a driver to build capacity for science, technology, and to serve our economy. Uh, w- the Emirates Mars mission was five times more difficult than any other mission we worked on before. You know, and, and because of the Emirates Mars mission, new ambitious programs in the UAE space program came up, okay. uh, and it set up the capability for that. Uh, Ministry for Advanced Science was set up. As a so the ripple there. effect was it, exactly, huge. and this is what his highness wanted to see. And maybe ten years down the line, you know, you would look back at these days and you will see what was the the nucleus, basically, of, of an yeah. industry that that has flourished. And this is why, going back to the point that his highness mentioned, that you guys have accomplished the majority of the mission before yeah. even reaching there. Yeah. And then his highness, Sheikh Hamid bin Rashid and Sheikh Hamid bin Zayed, and also the deputy prime ministers in the conference of Dubai, them being at the center before us arriving around Mars was a very strong message to us as a team. It boosted the spirit of so the So they team. were with you before you entered orbit? Yes, okay. so they were there. Okay. So basically the message was, regardless what the results are, yeah. we are here, we're here to support but you. what did you think? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, a mission that's announced Something by you worked on for six years, you know, going it, up in flames. Or not just this, it's, it's something that was announced by the president of the UAE and by the vice president of the UAE. Yes. And told the Arab world and the Arab youth that we will reach Mars before the 2nd of December 2021. Told the whole world. Well, exactly. Yes. And it's the first time that we actually send something into deep space. And it's the first time that the UAE and the Arab world explores another planet. Yeah. So for me, that was for me... The, the kind of the, the, the weight, the thing that was is like, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to put down, you know, like, or, or, or like disappoint, uh, I mean, uh, the team and also like, the, I mean, or, or like, so it promised or like uh, an announced by his highness, the president, something yeah. that you'd like to make sure that it gets achieved. 
And you know, but, we, we talk about like trial and error, but like yeah. with things on that scale, you know, it's it's very difficult to 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 fail at that level, basically. No, it's, it's, the thing is like failure was an option for us, and this is what His Highness yes. was trying to say. And that's when when then they came before us arriving. That was the message: failure is an option. It's okay, technical failure, but we as a nation we progressed. So. Failure to progress as a as a nation is not an option, and and what the government wanted to see from this government from, from this mission is that there is progress happening, that we are developing, and this mission is a catalyst for that change, and it was a catalyst for that change and the shift that that that, that a lot of people saw before us reaching orbit around Mars. Um, so so it it it's a very unique project, I think a once in a lifetime experience. Of course. Uh, that I feel very honored and uh, uh, thankful to be part of. So, so uh, let's let's maybe uh, try to imagine a little bit. Um, how feasible is it that we become a, a multi-planetary species? Is that even like conceivable in our lifetimes? It's an interesting question that I receive every now and then. Of course you receive See, I mean, it. <laughs> if, you, if you think about it, I mean, at the end you of the day... You work in the space center. In, this universe is, is huge. And, and if you look at uh, Earth from Mars, which we did look at Earth from Mars, mm -hmm. it's literally, it's a dot. It's a white dot. Oh, you were able to take a... So yeah, we, we took a picture and he's not even like, he, he posted a few pictures that were taken by, by okay. Hope Probe of, of okay. Earth, you know, as we are approaching Mars and as we're getting further away from Earth. And it's a small dot. Mm -hmm. It's a huge universe. Uh, with and Mars with is the closest uh, planet to Earth, correct? One of the closest planets to Earth, yeah. So okay. there's ones that are closer to the Sun, and there's the one further away. So oh, right. okay. Earth is in between. So okay, okay. So it's uh, it's um, as I said, it's it's a it's a it's quite humbling experience to see such thing, and that's that again that emphasizes the fact that this universe is huge. Uh, it has multiple galaxies. So is there a chance of life other than like than humans in this universe? I don't know the answer to that. There's always, from a scientific point of view, there's always a 50% chance. Yeah. You know? <laughs> there's nothing that says, says or proves that there's no other life okay. other than, 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 than what we have on planet Earth. And there's nothing that says that uh, we, we do have it. Mm -hmm. So especially if you look approach it from a scientific point of view, you have to be open-minded for any, for, for, for for both hypotheses. I was watching. I was watching the launch of Starlink. Uh, uh, actually, the presentation by Elon Musk uh, before the launch of Starlink, and he he showed the picture of that Tesla that they launched in space, and it says made made by humans, but yeah. <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, yeah. You know, if maybe one day we end up going in space and we'll come across this car somewhere floating around. Uh, but I think what what you know what I. I think what I like about uh, about you know what what he's done particularly is that he made the the subject of space very let's say more commercial and more uh, appealing and interesting. So I think it went from a science project to more of a of a something that's like aspirational. Uh, I mean, when he said things like uh, you know, uh, I mean, he, he NASA. I think I read also NASA plans to put people on Mars by twenty thirty, if I'm not mistaken. So, so like th there are efforts to put the first human on Mars, and and the reason why we're trying to do that is because again it help us understand what happened to that planet, uh, it help us explore that planet and see what resources it has, uh, and if there's any resources that will benefit us on Earth, yeah. and also on top of that it helps us and drives us and push us uh, to push our boundaries, to deliver technologies that are critical for Earth. If I'm able, able to develop, develop a technology uh, that helps a human survive in a harsh environment like the environment on the, we, that we have on Mars, yeah. so to eat, drink, and, and live a safe kind of uh, uh, life on Mars, then that same technology, I can actually use it on Earth. Mm -hmm. And if I develop a technology, let's say, that works in the desert, doesn't mean it's going to work in the North Pole. Mm -hmm. And if I develop technology that's going to work in the North Pole, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work in the desert. Mm -hmm. But if I develop a technology that's going to work in space, because whatever you put in space, it gets exposed to different extremes. Extreme hot mm -hmm. and extreme cold. I'm talking about extremes beyond what we experience on Earth. Yes. Then definitely that technology should be able to survive in different environments here. 
So you're not gonna you're not you're not gonna answer my question. Are we gonna go and, and are we gonna be a, a multi planetary species? Us like do you, do you see us in our lifetime? From my own personal view, our yeah. organic planet is planet Earth, and whatever we do is to save our planet. That doesn't mean we're not gonna explore other planets. That doesn't mean we're not gonna put humans on other uh, bodies in space or or planets in space. Uh, but whatever we do is about saving our planet because that's our organic planet. Okay, would you would you go to space if you have that uh, opportunity? Yeah, yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, I saw that again. There's there's plans uh, as well to put a million people on Mars by twenty sixty. I don't know how 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 realistic is I that. I think I think what's gonna drive that again? It's it's the it's our needs, our priorities, our national priorities will drive what activities will happen in space on and out of Mars. To be honest. And, and, and currently, let's say, from our point of view as the UAE, uh, water resources and food, resor- food resources are, are a challenge. And that's why the UAE announced, which is a separate project than the Mars Mars mission, the Mars 2117 project. It's a 100-year plan or strategy uh, for the UAE to build capacity and capability to help in putting the first human one day on Mars. So it's not about us reaching Mars or about us building like something there or like a colony. It's more about having the capacity and capability to do that. Why? Because our national priorities are, are water resources, food, food resources, and, and we need to have homegrown technologies that serve these, you know. Um, and another thing is also, if, um, if we are, in, it's, it's a challenge that we, we had, and basically a lot of questions that we received uh, from students and even uh, different sectors, if you talk about the academic sector. We have the Mars mission. We started these science programs. Students are going into sciences. Mm-hmm. What guarantees us that it's going to be something after MS Mars mission? Mm-hmm. So the Mars 2117 project was more like a commitment to the Emirati youth, uh, mm-hmm. to the, to the, to the dis- different sectors we have in the UAE, the, the industrial sector, the academic sector, and so on, that we are committed to building capacity or to exploring Mars for at least the next 100 years. So it's more of a commitment uh, from the government to the, youth, to, to the youth and to the stakeholders and other sectors to invest and continue building capacity in this area. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that, that was the mission. That's this, this why it was announced before us even uh, reaching or lo- even launching our mission into space. Uh, so, so that's part of it also. Okay. But again, as I said, it's national priorities that's going to drive that. Okay. So going back to, to, your, uh, to your experience, you've had now... Has it been, it's been just under a year, right? Or since... No, no so it's since been a year. In July? What? No, so we launched... Sorry, in February. You launched in July. Yeah, we launched in July 2021. 2020. Uh, sorry, 2020, yeah. We launched in July 2020. Yes. We after, uh, the journey took us seven months, in yes. which the spacecraft uh, traveled for more than 490 million kilometers. And we reached Mars on the 9th of February uh, 2021. And just one thing I'd like to highlight, actually, like, you know, this, this journey... Uh, a lot of people think, I mean, we used a Japanese rocket to, to launch the spacecraft. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was launched I, from Japan From well. Japan, yeah, Tendagashima, yes. yeah. In the middle of uh, the pandemic, when the whole world shut down, we had to huh. work and find ways to make sure that we launch uh, in July 2021, because that was the only opportunity we had. Or else we'll have in to wait. In 2020. T- 2020, sorry, yes. yeah. Yes. Or else we'll have to wait till 2022, which means we will not achieve the objective, the first objective set yes. for us. So... The, the job of the, of, the, of, the, of the Japanese launcher, the MHI launcher, ends one hour after the launch. So it's just a, it's actually 50 minutes after the launch. The spacecraft separates from mm-hmm. the launcher mm-hmm. and, and, and it, deploys, it deploys its solar panels and it turns its propulsion system, the one that was developed by the Emirates Mars mission team, mm-hmm. to travel from Earth to Mars. So we actually, it's the first time, and this is one of the, why, why the chances of failure was, were very high, because it's the first time we use our platform to travel that on, on, on such a long journey and, and then also use that same propulsion system to slow it down from 121,000 kilometers per hour average yeah. speed to about 18,000 kilometers per hour for 30 minutes firing this thrusters non-stop, non-stop. Yes. And this is not something you can test on Earth. It's interesting other for the people watching, I think, on, on this. So I think the... the it, it floats, right? And then before it enters orbit, you have to... You have to maneuver it. 
and it points basically in a different direction. The thrusters to slow go towards the planet, correct? Because to slow it down, yeah. So yeah. it's 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 not towards hundred percent the planet. There's a specific angle. This is a specific angle that we need to tilt the spacecraft on. Okay. And at a specific time, we need to start firing it. Yes. And then there's a delay, of course, in communication. So whatever we receive was eleven minutes late. Wow. So all of this had to happen autonomously. So the team had to develop a very smart system that does it autonomous, autonomously. And also a system that has a fault protection system designed in it that it detects any faults and reorients things if something fails mm -hmm. to, and to continue with the, the, with the Mars orbit insertion process. Mm -hmm. And that process took about, oh, like the insertion process took about 27 minutes. And how did you know that you're in Mars's orbit and everything's fine? So basically I, I had teams, uh, each team, uh, no, the image came out later. But you had each team focusing on different subsystems. So we had the team that's focused on the, the team that designed the, the proposed subsystem. They're checking the subsystem and letting me know. You have a team who's, who are monitoring the, alt, uh, the, the altitude and the attitude of the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And based on that, we know where the position, position of the spacecraft is, uh, the, the speed of the spacecraft. And then we have a system a team that's focused on the telecommunication system. So all these teams got back to me and informed me, okay, this is green, this is green, this is green, this is green. And, and based on the orientation of the spacecraft, the stability, the performance of the system, we knew that we are around Mars. And that's when I made the announcement of... Oh, uh, yes, I saw that. ...the UAE reaching Mars. That must have been an extremely proud moment for you. It and was for the proud. Team. It was a humbling experience. It was... Uh, I was in shock. Uh, it felt like a burden that was been uh, put off. Yeah. A big burden. So, so I felt now... Relieved. When, when the so the mission's duration is one year no so it's the mission one duration, martian year one martian year yeah. which is two years on two Earth. years so we are halfway through the mission yeah and then what you just let go of the probe or no. does it come back or what happens no so the spacecraft we've designed it to last at least four years okay so after two years earth years we hope to extend a mission so we come up with a new science okay. questions based on our uh, answers to the science questions that we have, the primary science questions. Okay. So based on that, we'll generate new questions okay. and then we extend the mission. Yeah. And we hope that it lasts longer. And it lasts course, because you have solar panels, right? So it, so uh, it, it uses battery. It's it two solar panels, yes, to, yeah. for energy and it charges the batteries yeah. uh, using the solar panels. Uh, and, and basically, um, we will keep extending the mission until we reach the end of life of the spacecraft. But... Okay. Uh, I mean, it's if you send something that's far away and something that you invested and you worked on a lot, you you wouldn't want to just leave it there and do nothing with it, you mm. know. And it's not something you can bring back. You can't. You cannot. It's just it doesn't have away. fuel to come back, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so so uh, and that's a technology by itself. Totally that's two hundred million dollars worth of like time, resources, yes. uh, you know, equipment, etc. Yes, which we'd like to fully utilize. Yeah. And and come up with the, the most out of it. So it's not just okay. one science mission. It's hopefully multiple science missions. What, what are there any kind of learnings that you can share with our audience about managing you know big projects like that? Yes, there's a lot. I mean, I mean, and, and, and these are certain things that I mean, I think if we didn't follow and we didn't actually apply, I don't think we would have achieved. And, and the first thing is to be humble enough to learn and to accept the fact that you know, uh, we don't know everything. Yeah. Uh, you, and we're talking about now you as the as the leader of this yes, project. Yes. Yeah. So you you need I'm I'm the leader, but I, it's the first time I managed the project. Yeah. So I was actually I had people reporting to me who were more experienced than me in yes. in, in in our uh, knowledge transfer partners uh, entities. Uh, I learned from them. They were my mentors. Uh, I had to take make decisions. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing, the involvement of the leadership. I mean, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin uh, and His Highness Sheikh Hamdan bin Mohammed, who is the president of the Mohammed Barash Space Center, and he was also supervising the project. Uh, their continuous follow up with us and support for the team played a big role. We faced a lot of hurdles. I mean, if you want to create a, dis create a disruptive change, uh, I mean, it's it's not easy. You 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 work with people in different sectors. You work with people with, with from a different mentality. We work with people who are used to certain ways of doing things, which you need to disrupt. Mm -hmm. So them being with us, them supporting the team, them guiding us throughout the process, really helped in facilitating these things. Uh, so, so the close relationship between the leadership and the government and, and, and the ownership that they had for the project really helped in, in, in delivering this project. 
Uh, the other thing is very important to understand that you need to focus on the priorities and the expectations. You're not here to please people. You need to focus on the objective that was set by the government and, and the, the, the expectation that the government has from this project. And that's what you need to focus on. Um, to keep your eyes on the, on the prize, basically. Oh, more, sometimes, I mean, if you want to keep your eyes on the prize, maybe you need to make people happy. But again, okay. if you want to get things done the way that the people or the government expecting it, you need to focus. Uh, on, on, on the objective. So you made people, yeah. some people unhappy? You have to, unfortunately. You, you shouldn't not care, you should care. And you should try as much as possible to, to manage relationships and make as much possible people happy if you can. But if you cannot, and which is usually the case, you need to accept it that you need to deliver at the end of the day. And you're not here to make people happy. And the other thing that I highly, um, important lessons learned for me was actually, and I always tell people that I think uh, and it's, it's basically the style that, that's, that's done by the leadership here in the UAE. Uh, as a project director, I always kept accountability on me. I delegated the responsibility. I delegated authority. But I made sure that my team understand that accountability staying, stays with me. So, and, and, and this is something that I, I, I felt helped me in getting things done. Uh, help to the team and learning and, and also move forward. Uh, is it risky? Yes. Were there some consequences for that? Yes, there were some consequences. But again, I'm not here to make their life difficult. I'm here to make sure that they feel comfortable to innovate and be creative because failure is an option at the end of the day. And, and, and again, if you want to compete, you need to take risks. And to take risks, you need, your team needs to be empowered. And empowered doesn't come with you throwing accountability on them. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and, and keeping the authority be accountable maybe for the exactly. deliverables, right? But not like no, the, the project the, success. Uh, yeah, the accountability stays with me. Yeah, and and, and I, I made it clear to them and to everyone the accountability stays with me. You need to you have the authority, you have the responsibility, uh, and and that builds trust uh, between us and and and, uh, uh, and and the team members. Uh, sometimes what you see is people keeping authority with them, but giving accountability and responsibility to team members, you know, which is not something that uh, I think works. And sometimes this is the mix-up that happens a lot in big projects. Uh, and, and I think that needs to be uh, closely uh, thought about, uh, especially by the leaders of any mission or yeah. any big ambitious disruptive project. How, how was your, uh, take us through like a normal day for you, is it, I mean, I mean, you have so many people that you have to talk to, you have to manage up, you have to manage down. Uh, Across the board. I had eight deputies in the mission. Okay. I had I had a deputy focused on the spacecraft. Uh, I had a deputy focused on the science. Uh, Sarah Lamiri, who's currently the minister. Uh, I had a deputy focused on the ground networks. A deputy focused on the operations. A deputy focused on resources, financial and human resources. Deputy focused on uh, mission assurance, quality assurance, and logistics. And a deputy focused on strategic planning which is basically the media, the outreach, education outreach, and things like this. Um, he was basically, uh, who's currently the, the, the Deputy Director General in the UAE Space Agency. Uh, all of those people worked with, with, with me as one team. Uh, and then there were multiple stakeholders that we had to work with. And, 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 and again, that doesn't get easy also. So every day it was very interesting. We, we, we started use, using Zoom since 2014 literally before the okay. pandemic. So for us, when the pandemic happened, working from home before was normal. Before people had the Zoom fatigue. No, no, because, yeah, because I had actually, I mean, a team of Emiratis had three, like, uh, if you, I can like, categorize three teams of Emiratis that I had in the, in the mission. A team that was based in the US, full-time, for five years, minimum. A team that was based in the UAE, that was working on the mission. And a team that was between the US and the UAE flying. So to manage these teams and work together, and we all had to work as one team, was quite interesting and the time difference was a big challenge. So uh, we had to adjust our working hours in the organization because of the Emirates Mars mission team. So uh, people started work at 6 a.m. Uh, were allowed to start work at 6 a.m. and finish early. Uh, because, and then people who had to work early in the morning and early in the evening, you know, so they had to split uh, work, um, their, their, their working hours. Uh, also we had to like come up with a system that accommodates that. So it, one thing that, 
I mean, I, I've learned from this was that you, 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 when they come and tell you you need to separate private life from work, mm-hmm. you cannot when it comes to missions like this. What, what helped me was I made my work my lifestyle mm-hmm. or part of my lifestyle, you know, and this is what helped me sort of navigate. And people who couldn't do that struggled mm-hmm. and who were the ones who managed to do that actually were able to, 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 to live around it and work with it. So for me, like, it was usual for me to have 6 a.m. meeting or sometimes 5 a.m. meetings, you know, and then go to work and then have to come back and then, you know, do my personal stuff and then have a meeting at 8 o'clock in the evening all the way to midnight or 11 o'clock, uh, at least two or three times a week. At that time, the weekends were different. It was Friday, Saturday. Yes. So, so we had to work on Fridays if we had to. And, and as I said, we made it more like a, a like part of our lifestyle work. Uh, and, and that's how me personally managed to, to navigate around it, you know. At the yeah. same time, try to keep my obligation towards my family and do certain exercise when I need, when, maintain my exercises, do things that, you know, mm-hmm. you have to do in your personal life. It's, it's, I mean, these, you know, these, these big, big projects, I think, require so much dedication. You can't, you can't do it otherwise. As you said, it's a, such a big commitment. It's a life-changing, uh, you know, project for you, I'm sure. It is, it is definitely. Yeah. So, so if so, if you had to distill this to some advice to people, what would it be? I mean, you because you you did the sacrifice. You spent seven years in, in South Korea, whether it's sacrifice or not. But you did leave your own country to travel to another country while you were very young, and you did pursue uh, your education. Um, you know, I think maybe people these days feel very entitled, and they want things to come very easily. Uh, handed to them and so on but uh, so is there some advice maybe looking back at it that you think uh, you know uh, it kind of put you in this uh, situation yeah my advice is work hard yeah work hard and it will pay off work hard be humble to learn uh, be flexible you need to be very agile and have goals in your life I mean, even if you don't achieve the goals, it doesn't mean they have not achieved anything because having a goal will make you move towards that goal, mm-hmm. you know, so it will help you move forward. And that path might not be straight. Mm-hmm. And most probably, 99.9% is not going to be straight. It's going to be like a zigzag, mm-hmm. okay? And there's going to be setbacks, but that's normal. Uh, always be out of your comfort zone. Always be out of your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Meaning, ne- like... Like, don't, don't go go with the easy way out with things, you know. I mean, if, if, if there's something that's new, that's ambitious, uh, that's n- not usual, that involves risks, go for it. Yeah. But be smart about it, of, of course. Don't take just random risks. You have to be smart about taking risks. You need to take measured risks. I need to manage and mitigate those risks. Measured risk is, uh, is tricky, right? Because you only know in hindsight. You only know when things happen. Uh, so I think it's... Uh... But experience helps. And that's yeah, why I'm saying you, work hard. Mm. The more, the harder you work, the more focused you are, the better you understand the risks and you assess the risks in, in a better way. It doesn't guarantee you that you mm. actually fully mitigated the risk. It doesn't guarantee that. And, 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 and again, when you look at risks, that's another advice. A risk is not, it's not a problem that happened. Mm-hmm. Okay? Uh, a risk is you identifying a problem before it happens and avoiding it turning into a problem. Because one, it be, once it becomes a problem, then it's not a risk. It's mm-hmm. a problem that you need to solve. Mm-hmm. You know? And this is what risk is. You identify problems way in advance and put the mitigation plans to avoid reaching uh, uh, or having that problem occurring. I think what, what I find very interesting and in, in what you've done is that you have decided to uh, take a risk maybe or take a chance and, and go to South Korea and... And, and spend the time there without necessarily calculating that, oh, six years, seven years down the line, I'm going to be the head of the Emirates Mars mission. You just did it because this is something you believe in, that you love and you enjoy. And I think maybe maybe taking on that risk without necessarily... Um, you, you don't do something because you're going to get something, basically. Well, it's, it's a very, very, good, very good point and question, actually. And, and I mean... The way I said, actually, I never expected that one day I'll work 
on a Mars mission. Mm-hmm. I never expected to work on a space program in my mm-hmm. life. There was no, I mean, there I, was, well. No, I mean, when I was young, we only had like Thoraya that was launched and we were, as a nation, we were just operating satellites. We didn't mm-hmm. really develop spacecraft. And uh, every time I, I, I was thinking, I was like, oh, it'll be so nice one day if we actually have built our own spacecraft on our own. And I never thought it was gonna happen in my lifetime. I thought maybe mm-hmm. our children or grandchildren will do that. Um, and even when I was in the university, I used to look at my, because I, I studied in the US and I spent four years there and I saw a lot of my friends who used to internship in NASA and these places. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, so lucky they're able to work on a space program. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it would be nice if one day we have this in the UAE. And literally the day I graduated, I come back to the UAE, the first thing comes up to me is like, we're trying to start, they came to me and they're like, we're trying to start a space program. Would you like to be part of it? I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, I, remember, yeah, I remember when I was young. I, 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 I mean, it's very close to where we are now. There's a, a very old antenna uh, in, in Jabal Ali area. Uh, yes. I used to go like, on <laughs> desert hacks or on horses uh, with my, my siblings and my dad, you know, and a small group of people do uh, ride horses in that area. It was literally desert. I used to look at those antennas and I'm like, wow, those are huge. Mm-hmm. Now I look at them, they're like, mm, they are much bigger <laughs> antennas that I've seen and that we have now in the UAE, but I was like, wow. And I, I used to feel the weight of it. I used to feel like inspired by just looking at it, you know. And it's all quiet. Nothing mm-hmm. is around you, you know. And you see that thing by itself. It makes you think about space. And, and, and today, I, I'm... But you, you went into engineering and not space because you didn't see that there was a kind of a career track, right? No, so, I mean, there's no specific major in space. I mean, if to build a space mission, you need to have electrical engineering. You need to have... So, after a while, after you build multiple spacecraft or, or, or you develop multiple missions and you work on it, that's when you can be called a, a, a space engineer or, okay. or a space scientist. You know, so, but it, you have to start from some specialized background. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, when I went to South Korea, again, I still didn't expect that we we're going to work on a, on, a, on a Mars mission. But I knew it's something new. I knew it's something ambitious. I knew it's a new opportunity. I knew it's unique. It's different. And that's why I went there. And when I went there, it was supposed to be for two years only. Mm-hmm. And those two years ended up being seven years. And before going to South Korea, actually, when I graduated with my bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia in electrical engineering, I was planning to come back here, maybe find a job, and then go and do and pursue. Get married. Uh, no, more like uh, get, uh, get my master's, in, oh, okay. in probably in, 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 in either telecommunication or electrical engineering. Okay. That was the plan. plan. That totally changed because this opportunity came up. I never thought I'll actually major or get a degree in, in science technology policy, which exposed me to different uh, specializations and areas other than just engineering mm. and, and technology. Uh, and it overlapped very well with my background. Uh, so there you go. You took risk, not mitigated. I, I mean, yes. again, you didn't throw yourself, but it was managed. It was risk. It was managed risks. It was, you know, uh, so I thought <laughs> about it and there was a vision. There was a vision to be unique. There was a vision to try to, to, to uh, move forward with my career and, and, and bring something new to the UAE. How were your family, uh, uh, how did they react when you said you're leaving? Coming back from the US and then saying I'm going to go, back, go yeah. to Korea. Uh, the first question, for how long? And I was like, two years. They were very supportive. Okay. Uh, I mean, you can see that the, at the end of the day, like, like parents, you know, they, 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 they like to have their their children around them, you know, and not having me around for four years and then going again. So you can see that, like, you know, we see the, the purpose, we understand it, you know, and, and we agree with it. And, and, and it's, it's something that you should do. So, but you can feel that, like, you know, that, 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 that part of them that wants me to stay, but part of, part of, part of them that really want me to go because it's, it's an excellent opportunity. So it was mixed feelings uh, in that sure sense, but they were very supportive. I'm sure they're extremely yeah. proud of you. No. Well, I'm proud to have parents like them. Uh, That's great to hear. They're the reason why I am here today. Um, the values, the, the things, the priorities in life that we learn, uh, the way they invested in, 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 in raising us, uh, the time they spent with us, is the reason why we are here today. Okay, you mentioned in a very important word, which is values. I'm curious, what, what, what kind of... I wanted to stop this interview, but you just said this word, so, I, so I'm going to do one last question. What kind of values uh, did, you, did you grow up around? Because you seem to be someone that has like very strong worth, work so, ethic. Like. So the, the values are basically, you know, uh, I mean, be good to everyone, be good to your nation. 
I mean, at the end of the day, whatever you do, uh, you need to be grateful for what you have, uh, because whatever we have today is better than what others had in the past in this region. Uh, we need to be thankful. Um, and we need to believe in, 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 in people. And these are the things that have been like embedded in me since I was young by my parents. Uh, and it's not just about you. Always think about the bigger picture, not just you. And, and this is something that uh, I always try to emphasize to, to the younger generation. You know, always think about the bigger picture. Because well. collect collectively, we do much better than uh, individually. Uh, so bigger picture has bigger returns. Well, you're working in space uh, programs, so it can't get any more bigger, <laughs> bigger picture than that. <laughs> so, so they've done a great job. Thank you so much, uh, Amran. It Thank was you. great to have you. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much for tuning into this uh, very inspiring episode of Conversations with Lulu. It was such a pleasure to host Amran Sharaf. Uh, such a young and bright uh, individual and uh, it was truly an honor to meet him and talk to him. Uh, as usual, you can listen to this conversation on all podcast apps and you can watch it on YouTube. If you want to reach out to me, you can visit conversationswithlulu.com and you can uh, there's a contact uh, sheet there where you can reach out to me for speaking requests, for sponsorships, for guest recommendations and more. Uh, if you want to connect with me on social media, you can find me on Instagram and LinkedIn and Twitter at Lulu Hazen. Thank you so much for tuning in and see you in a few weeks.